Hello and welcome. My guest tonight is the wonderful Professor Emeritus from the University of Minnesota, Pauline Boss. Many of you, I'm sure, have heard about her work. She's written a book that is considered a classic called Ambiguous Loss. And we're going to talk about that book tonight and about some of her other writings. She is the um, uh, past president of the National Council on Family Relations, which mm -hmm. I'm sure was a big job. She is a former psychotherapist, now a consultant, mm -hmm. researcher, writer, and I'm just delighted she could come back and talk about this big topic. I told her just a minute ago that I think almost all of us have dealt with ambiguous loss uh, in our lives, and I'll have her define it, but uh, listen carefully because it's a very complex topic, but one that we can learn and grow from and, and uh, feel better about our lives, uh, I think, when we deal with this. So welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Mary. Pleasure. My pleasure. If you were sitting next to me and I didn't know what ambiguous loss was at all and we were on an airplane, how would you define it just in layman's terms? It has a very simple definition. Ambiguous loss is an unclear loss. Uh, it's the most stressful loss there is because there's no possibility of closure. A person can be physically missing and you don't know if they're dead or alive, like a soldier missing in action or the Malaysian airliner or the tsunami in Japan that washed away people. But people don't know if they're dead for sure because they have not seen a body. And so they remain very stressed because of that and the loss is unclosed. It can also mean when the person is here, present, physically, but they're psychologically absent, such as if there's Alzheimer's disease or one of the 58 other kinds of dementia that are taking the mind away from some people. Or it can be issues like autism or addiction uh, and so on, or, or serious mental illness. And I think it's those, those kind of losses, what you call, I guess, the psychological losses that are so common in our society. The workaholic who then isn't yes. available. That's right. Um, the stressed out parent, the, the, as you said, the child with autism, the person having an affair. All That's of right. these things touch families um, up and down the, the scale. Worked with a family once where the children said when dad comes home his head is still in his briefcase. Mm -hmm. That kind of description is the psychological mm -hmm. ambiguous loss, yes. Do you feel that one is harder to deal with than the other? I'm guessing the physical loss would be harder, but that's The physical a loss seems to have more brutality with it. Um, the physical loss, uh, uh, terrorists now use um, kidnapping uh, all over in Syria and uh, the Ukraine and other places because killing a family member hurts less than kidnapping them. It hurts longer if you kidnap them and they now know that and use it. Uh, I learned this from the International Committee of the Red Cross and the Red Crescent mm -hmm. uh, which use the ambiguous loss model now to help mm -hmm. families in the villages where men and boys have been kidnapped mm -hmm. uh, and how to help the remaining family members live with that. It also happens in Africa, of course, but around the world, really. How did you decide to focus in on this? Because it's not a topic that's been written about a lot prior no, to yeah. your research, has it? No, it hasn't. And I came up with it as a graduate student at the mm. University of Wisconsin in Madison. Um, I was studying psychology, child development, but also sociology, and I was also in psychiatry. So you might notice that the ideas about ambiguous laws cross disciplines. It's interdisciplinary, and I, I like that about mm -hmm. it. And I was taking a theory building class, and I was thinking about psychological father absence in intact families. Uh, like the corporate executive family at that time, but it could be mothers today, too, where mothers could be psychologically absent. And the professor said, Pauline, it's about more than fathers. 
he said, to go home and raise this concept to a higher level. Mm -hmm. And so I you were did. challenged. I was challenged, good yeah. professor. <laughs> and I came up with the term ambiguous loss, which then mm -hmm. could include any gender, any age, uh, any culture. And so really, it was an idea I had as a returning adult graduate student. I was in my uh, early 30s at the time. That's very exciting, interesting to hear. I mean, kind of the light bulb. It was a light bulb, kind of yes. Moment, wasn't it, or a period of, of time. Yes. Huh. And then did it just keep deepening for you? You kept getting more and more. It did um, for me. Intrigued but by it. in that, at that time period, the um, 70s, uh, especially in the social sciences, uh, a phenomenon did not exist unless you could quantify it, put numbers on it. Mm -hmm. And ambiguity is hard Measure to quantify. It. <laughs> yes. And so, um, but I had uh, some older professors, mentors, <laughs> who supported me and my work. And so I wasn't done in. And I was able to hold on and get tenure down at Madison and published enough mm -hmm. to do that. Um, and then I was recruited to come up here and I continued the work. And it has deepened continually ever since, except that now, uh, in recent years, I don't do the research, uh, but there's a whole new generation of researchers. And uh, we have published journals where all their work is in there now. Mm -hmm. um, and Many are from the International Red Cross, testing the ideas about ambiguous loss in the field around the world. You read it where the Red Cross is in the world, in the mm -hmm. newspaper. But also, um, it's with uh, uh, brain injury, with Alzheimer's disease. Right. And the newest one, I would never have thought of, is being used with families where a child is transitioning gender and so it has to do with the yeah. families. From the point of view of the family, we have a child, but the child isn't the same as it was. But it's also from the point of view of the young person, if in fact their family kicks them out. They have a family, mm -hmm. but they don't have a family. So well, they That's interesting. And another recent development, fairly recent, would be um, you, you use the phrase shadow parents when a baby is born via artificial insemination and so there is a, another family but you don't you don't know know who that yes. family and that troubles is. some of the children yeah. who were born that way yeah. so the concept of um, a dialectic you can be absent and present at the same time the young people call it non-binary now mm, right, in that right. it isn't just uh, he's gone or you're either gone or you're here. You're either dead or alive. Right. Well, it doesn't always work out that way. The Japanese people in Fukushima, uh, they don't know if their loved ones are dead or alive. Probably dead, but maybe not. And the mothers whose babies were washed out of their arms from the tsunami often say the baby's on another island being taken care of by some good woman. Mm -hmm. So and there is a, a mystery about it that They I take remember. advantage of, yes. And you wrote also that the Native American culture uses some mystery kind of language to, They've always, to explain uh, loss. And nature and everything. Right, right. So, Many, we come from a mass reorient culture which wants closure, which, which wants precision, which mm -hmm. wants an end product. And that's mm -hmm. why the Kubler-Ross stages of grief, even Kubler-Ross in her last years said, forget about it. Did she? She said it's messy, messier than that. It's not linear. I knew that. It goes back and forth. Back and forth. Mm -hmm. And we call it oscillation. You have up and down days. Mm -hmm. But your up and down days come farther apart as time goes on. And then you may, 20 years from the time of the loss, have a bad day again, which is normal. For those of you who maybe know the, the stages but maybe wouldn't know the name Kubler-Ross, there is the shock when you have a loss. There's denial. There's anger, depression. depression acceptance. Finally, we're acceptance. We're forgetting one. Um, bargaining. Bargaining, yeah, that's it. it. But as you say, it's not linear. 
And Kubler-Ross designed those stages for the person who's dying, not for the family right. members. And so what we know now, and with all this new research on grief, is that the, um, you learn to live with grief. You don't have to get over it. Mm -hmm. and, and what some of us are adding to the grief literature, and what I've added, tried to add, is the type of grief matters. Mm -hmm. So if, for example, a 90-year-old grandparent dies, it's still sad, but it's not traumatic as if a baby would die. Right. Uh, and so type of it's grief matters. It's more expected. It's more expected. Mm -hmm. And in my case, the type of grief, meaning it's unclear, it's ambiguous, that's all new material now. And it apparently explains a lot for people who feel like they've lost something, but nobody died. And there's no way that society has figured out yet to have rituals about that kind of loss. Um, they haven't, except that I've noticed um, among caregivers for Alzheimer's disease and other dementias, they're starting now to group together, to meet with each other. And they have their own, I'm not sure I'd call them rituals, but they now understand each other. They're not isolated anymore. Um, the statistic was terrible. We're in the same boat. Kind We're of. in the mm -hmm. same boat. We're mm -hmm. not alone. Mm -hmm. Isolation is a terrible thing and brings on depression for the healthiest, healthiest right. of us. And then the statistic was that caregivers for Alzheimer's disease die at a rate 66 percent higher oh. than their same age group. Mm. I think that has changed. That might be changing in recent years because of the wonderful things that uh, people are doing to come together, mm -hmm. that the caregiver does not have to stay home 24-7. There are now ways and helpers to get out into the community. Now, I was in Phoenix, where I think it is stunning. Mm -hmm. uh, and they may be ahead of the game because mm -hmm. it's a city of older people. Mm -hmm. But I'm hoping that that's taking place all over now. That, Neighbors are helping neighbors more than they did originally. There's, There's less stigma. A big push, I think, nationally, act on Alzheimer's to, to get the communities more involved. Right. But I want to go back just a little, Pauline, to what's going on in, inside a person when you don't have the closure. Um, you, you sometimes give up hope, of course, but um, from what your, your writing sounded like, there can be kind of a deadening of the spirit. Can you talk a little bit about that and how common that is? The people who have somebody who's ambiguously lost, whether it's physical or psychological, eventually have to have new hope to replace the old hope or to alongside the old hope. The old hope always is, um, let's find the lost person. Uh, let's have this dementia go away. Mm -hmm. and, and sometimes they know they know that won't happen. Well, they hope. But they and hope, then yeah. with dementia, for example, there are moments of clarity. And right. then they think, oh, That's maybe true. he can get better. Maybe she mm -hmm. can get better. So what we do is encourage them, the groups that now get together, to talk about new hope. We don't tell them to give up the old hope. We're just hoping if they can think of some new hope. Mm -hmm. I think I might travel more. Or I think I might, one woman said, I'm going back to choir. I've loved singing, and I've been homebound taking care of my husband so long. She's going to sing again. Mm -hmm. Some people go back to school. Some people um, try something new athletically. And while they might not be able to do it at that moment, thinking about it is delicious, and it may keep mm -hmm. them alive. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, while they're caregiving, they can explore on the computer next to the bed. Mm -hmm. Make some plans. Make some plans. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's the both and thinking is what we've discovered is the way to lower the stress of being caught in this ambiguous loss web of not knowing. So, so you're really giving the, the person permission to still keep hoping, but to add something 
new and fresh. It has to be something new. Mm -hmm. And eventually you say, now, once, before if it's a lost person, you know, from the Holocaust on down uh, to people being missing now and kidnapped, people lost at sea, the Malaysian airliner, mm -hmm. it might go for a lifetime. And so you've got to keep living. Mm -hmm. uh, I can tell you the story that came from the Ukraine, from an international Red Cross worker. Um, it was a family where the husband, um, I don't know if it was diabetes, but he was not well, the father. And the, the son, the mother's favorite son, she said, helped her to take care of him by earning some money mm -hmm. and helping her. And he was kidnapped. Mm -hmm. and uh, not too long ago, because there's kidnapping going on still ter by terrorists mm -hmm. uh, and politically. And she was so distraught when the Red Cross worker came to her house and he told her a little bit about ambiguous loss, which they are doing now, but did not much, just sitting there acknowledging and witnessing mm -hmm. her pain. He said he came back a month later and she was just fine. And he said, what changed? And she took him by the back door, and there was a jacket hanging. Uh, and she said, this is my son's jacket. And she said, every month when my stipend comes from the government for having apparently a missing person, she puts the money in the pocket of her son's jacket. And as she needs money to help take care of the house and the groceries and her ailing husband, she said, he's helping me because I take the money from his jacket. Mm -hmm. So that's the symbolic way people cope with ambiguous loss. He's there, but he's not there. So using her memories of him, her and the jacket, great love symbol. of him, very interesting. And putting the money in. Uh -huh. People are very creative and very resilient in coping with ambiguous loss, but therapists have tended to miss it because it's sometimes considered rather strange behavior. Mm -hmm. Is that strange behavior? Right now in Fukushima, where people were washed away, there's an old phone booth that somehow got stranded. People go in there now and call up their missing loved ones and have a conversation really? with them, even oh, children. Oh. And my viewpoint, more from the symbolic interaction perspective, is that's good. I'm not going to tell them that that's delusional. Mm -hmm. We don't know about all of where missing people go. We don't know. Mm -hmm. There's no proof. And in the absence of proof, all theories are valid. And of course, there's, there's a place where I would draw the line. Mm -hmm. And um, if there's abuse or addiction or um, homicide or sure. suicide. Did you get involved with the Japanese tsunami um, by chance, or how did you get pulled into studying that particular mm -hmm. disaster? I think, as I said to you earlier, we have not we have not followed that as closely as I thought we would as a country here. I mean, they're still they're still dealing suffering, with it. and um, we've it's a kind triple of gone disaster. On. And yes, they, five four women called me. Uh, emailed me from Japan asking if they could come to the United States and stud study mm -hmm. with me about what I did in New York after 9-11 with the families mm -hmm. of the missing. And I've been working with those women ever since. Mm -hmm. uh, they are now leaders in, in Japan. Are in they this area. psychologists? Or? One was a social worker, one was a psychiatrist, one was a nurse. Mm -hmm. And did I say social worker? Mm -hmm. Psychologist. Mm -hmm. So they're interdisciplinary, a family therapist too. And uh, they came to the University of Minnesota and we had two days of training about mm -hmm. how you work with families of the missing, ambiguously lost. Mm -hmm. And they have gone back now and tr they translated the textbook for professionals. They are now training. They are now the experts. Oh, and I went a year later to Fukushima and mm -hmm. Sendai and worked with the people, the professional people there directly. And then since then by Skype and more recently just by email, because I told these five women they now have to become the leaders 
in family therapy for working with the families of the missing, and they are. They're doing a wonderful job. That's very job. exciting. I bet you love to see your ideas spread. I do. In such a important way. It's, it's great. It's just uh, astounding to yeah, me that it's wonderful. going around the world. That is wonderful. Uh, and it's going, it seems it to It doesn't take a huge number of people to, to spread it either, does it? I mean, you no, can work no. through individuals. And sadly, there are always occasions that call for it. Yes, yes, of course. Um, there are some, um, you use the phrase silver lining, um, there are some things that are positive that can happen to people dealing with ambiguous loss. Can you list just a couple? Because I found that part of the book very interesting. Now, the thing that happens with people who have an ambiguous loss of either kind, psychological or physical, who maintain a reasonably good life despite it, they find they become very strong. They're stronger than they were before mm -hmm. the event mm -hmm. occurred, which we call mm -hmm. resilience now, they're very mm -hmm. resilient. But I also think that we live in a culture of mastery. That is, we want to be in charge of things, so if we work hard and do good, things will turn out the way we want them. Well, the people with ambiguous loss have experienced that you can be a good, hard-working person and it still won't turn out right for you. Once we learn that, we are deeper psychologically, we are more mature, we are stronger. It's a hard lesson to learn from a mastery-oriented society. The idea is that um, the higher we can tolerate ambiguity, the more mature we are emotionally. And so that's not a lesson, for example, that the Native Americans need to learn as much as those of us who are more can-do oriented. So it's letting go of control to some yep, degree? exactly. And you also said it can result in being more willing to take risks. Right. In a positive way. In a positive way. Risks with your career, positive kind of risks lifestyle-wise. And that's an exciting yes. way to view it. My, the psychiatrist I studied with down at Madison, Carl Whitaker, said that, uh, he's, he said that uh, spontaneity was a sign of good mental health. And I never quite knew what he meant until I went to his funeral much many years later and his grandchildren spoke and they told us what they liked the most about what grandfather did. And it was when he took each child one by one and said, let's go get lost in the car. Uh -huh. And uh -huh. without an agenda, without a map, uh -huh. And I tried it with my own grandchildren. They loved it. Huh. And they're now college age. They still want to do it. Oh, wow. And in fact, my husband and I, uh, on a nice Sunday afternoon, one of us will say, let's go get lost. Oh. And you need a, a, a gas tank that is full, but that's all. I should let the uh, viewers in on who her husband is very special man in, in our Twin Cities, Dudley Riggs. Yes. Is Pauline's husband yes. of 29 years. Yes. Um, uh -huh. So True. I can see the two of you getting lost and having great fun. We do have great fun. And yeah. of course in Minnesota, if you say let's go get lost, you run into a, a new lake sooner or later and that's part of the fun too. Yeah, there, there are great outcomes from not following the beaten that's tra right. trail. And right? I think we have to let go sometimes of plans and having things the way we want, because life delivers surprises. Well, I think of the serenity prayer, you know, God grant me the serenity to, you know, let go, really. I want to hold up your books, and we okay. have three to share with you, so um, take a look. These, these are all wonderful books. The first one is the, the book I described as a classic, um, Ambiguous Loss. And the subtitle is Important, Learning to Live with Unresolved Grief. Mm -hmm. And um, this came out about when, Pauline? 99. I was a visiting professor at Harvard at that time. I wrote that at Harvard. And Harvard uh, University Press was the publisher, publisher. correct? Uh-huh. And I as I told Pauline, this book, I think, is beautifully written. 
Thank Can you, you share some wonderful stories about your grandfather and his mother? My father. Or your father and his mother, your yes, grandmother. Yes, the child of an immigrant. I'm sorry, I'm uh -huh. stating it wrong, but that was so poignant to me and some of the ambiguous loss that went on in your family because of not ever seeing Immigration. your grandmother mm -hmm. who was abroad. It, the idea of ambiguous loss is often picked up by immigrants who have a family back there somewhere. Uh, and, and so they have a family, but they're not nearby. And with all our immigrants now, I mean, this book is so important to understanding what life is like for them. We're holding up now the book Lost Trauma and Resilience. And you said this is really a book that talks a lot about coping what strategies. To do, what to do with ambiguous mm -hmm. loss and the six guidelines that I developed for living with ambiguous loss. There's a chapter on each one in there. So I talk about finding meaning and, t and uh, adjusting mastery, which we talked about, and, and re revising your identity, and normalizing ambivalence, and revising attachment, and finding new hope, which is what we talked mm, about at right. the beginning. Yeah, I would like to dig into that. And then the, the last book we're going to share, and we talked some about dementia. You said in the book that one out of three families in our country has someone with dementia. Or Alzheimer's. One kind of dementia. There are 58 kinds That's of dementia. Right. So it's one out of three have Alzheimer's? I'm not sure now if it's that. But it's a lot of people who are dealing uh -huh. with ambiguity. And yes, they of, are. Yes, they are. Whole. With an aging population, too. Right, mm -hmm. and the baby boomers. I wrote this for families, so uh, I tried to use an accessible um, way of writing. And um, it really is designed for um, reading groups. And this is another great book. Well, we're out of time. Thank you so much for coming down. My it's pleasure. It's been Always great Mary. to um, Thank you. pick your brain and learn from you. And I think you can tell why I was so excited about this interview. It's, it's so important, I think, for all of us to, to really look inward and see, see how we can grow through this kind of um, And what experience. we've done with our own ambiguous losses. Right. Yes. Thank you for being with us. I'll be back again next week. Until then, have a good week.